speaking the unspeakable. Mother language before the Reformation. People I talk with about using motherly language and pictures to talk about God often accept that the Bible uses motherly pictures. But because fatherly pictures are so common in the New Testament, they assume that talk of God as mother died out after the Bible was completed. This is just not true. For more than 1,300 of those 1,900 years, the main theologians and writing pastors of the Christian Church were happy to use motherly pictures. Syriac Fathers and the Womb of the Spirit Sorry, this gets a bit technical, but Syriac was a dialect of Aramaic and the language that was spoken by many of the earliest Christians. For some years, it was as important as Greek or Latin in the early church. It's a Semitic language, like the Hebrew in which almost all the Old Testament is written. Because spirit is grammatically a feminine word in the Semitic languages, the pronoun she was naturally used when talking about the Holy Spirit. This made it easy to picture her as mother. This happened very regularly when thinking about baptism particularly, because baptism is the ceremony which marks new birth into Christ. There are lots of examples of this language from Syriac Christian writers and preachers over many centuries. Syrian Orthodox and Maronite baptismal services still in use express this idea very clearly using the phrase the womb of the Spirit. For example, Blessed are you, Lord God, through whose great and indescribable gift this water has been sanctified by the coming of your Holy Spirit, so that it has become the womb of the Spirit that gives birth to the new man out of the old. And similar wording was indeed already present in the service attributed to Timothy. Indeed, we beseech you, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, send your living Spirit and sanctify this water, that it may become the womb of the Spirit that gives rebirth anew to mankind who are baptized in it. In more theological discussion of baptism, this paternal role of the Holy Spirit is linked back to the very beginning of Scripture, where the Spirit of God is described as hovering over the primeval waters. The word that's often translated hover in English, in Genesis 1 verse 2, is rare in the Bible, and translators vary between sweep, move, beat, brood, and hover. What is clear is it's used of birds, and most of these translations reflect that. The early Syriac translation used a word which is very similar to the Hebrew word, because Syriac, Aramaic, and Hebrew are cousins. But that word clearly meant brood, like a hen hatching chicks. If you can describe yourself as born again, who do you picture as the mother who gave you this new birth? Such talk of the Spirit as mother, and of baptism as her womb, did not come naturally to Greek and Latin speakers, because, as Jerome reminded his readers, when thinking of the forming of Christ in the believer, in Galatians 4.19, spirit is feminine in the Semitic languages, but masculine in Latin and neuter in Greek. A nice reminder, Jerome thinks, that in the Godhead there is no gender, in divinitate einim nullus est sexus. Several of the best-known and most influential Greek and Latin fathers similarly stress that God is not gendered. And some of them mention the passage in Galatians 3.28 in support of this. God the Father as Mother Because in Latin and Greek spirit is not feminine, there is not among these writers a stronger tendency to picture the spirit as mother. However, this means that they were more free to speak of God the Father as mother. Thus, Clement tries to explain the love of God like this. What else is necessary? Behold the mysteries of love, and then you will have a vision of the bosom of the Father, whom the only begotten Son alone declared. God in his very self is love, and for love's sake he became visible to us. And while the unspeakable part of him is Father, the part that has sympathy with us is mother. By his loving, the father became of woman's nature, a great proof of which is he whom he begets from himself. And the fruit that is born of love is love. Here Clement illustrates how a mix of father and mother pictures encourages different truths about God to be expressed together. 
for Clement, in a world of distant, respected fathers, and intimate, loving mothers, thinking of God as Father helps us to recognize the unspeakable, the transcendent nature of God, while thinking of God as Mother helps us realize the nature of God as love. The Motherly Son Thought of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus as God, as motherly, is also present throughout, and reached its peak in a prayer by the great pastor and theologian Anselm of Canterbury. The prayer influenced a whole stream of motherly spirituality about Christ, particularly among the Cistercians and in the writings of Bernard of Clairvaux. Anselm's prayer is addressed to St. Paul, but expresses his difficulty in accepting God's grace. He feels unworthy, and, though he knows Christ died for sinners, he still finds his sense of sinfulness as a barrier. Then he remembers that Paul and the other apostles spoke of themselves as being like mothers, giving birth and feeding to the Christian communities they founded. If they are like mothers, how much more is Jesus who died to give us life, our loving mother? And Anselm can't imagine a divine mother who will turn away her child. Think of Isaiah 49.15 And so he's able to approach Christ in this way. Trinitarian thinking Perhaps the fullest flowering of such thinking of and relating to God as motherly came in the writing of Julian of Norwich. Julian, her birth name's unknown, was one of the most influential Christian mystics at the end of the 14th and early 15th centuries. Her showing of love is an extended meditation on the love of God, and makes extensive use of motherly language and pictures. Julian explicitly speaks of the whole Trinity and each of the persons, Father, Son and Spirit, as motherly. She is thus a fine example of how one can both avoid speaking of God as gendered, and use motherly language, without risking splitting the Godhead. As the trend in the 1970s to speak of only the Spirit as mother, risked doing. Strange unspeakability. In view of these fourteen hundred years or so of willingness to speak of God as motherly, it seems particularly strange that for more than four hundred of the next five hundred years such talk was almost silent. When researching my thesis I only found one example of motherly talk of God between 1450 and the twentieth century. What accounts for this strange unspeakability of one of the most powerful pictures that can help us to understand and relate to God more fully. Is it, as C.S. Lewis clearly felt, and many people do today, that such talk is heterodox, leading into error? If so, then, the most respected Christian thinkers of the first fourteen hundred years fell into the trap. For example, Irenaeus, Eusebius, Gregory of Nyssa, Chrysostom, Ambrose, and Augustine, as well as Jerome and Clement, or might have been cited above as examples. I suspect, and chapter 9 of my thesis argued, that the growth in the Catholic Church of the veneration of Mary the mother of Jesus as a quasi-divine mother figure reduced the need to talk of God as mother. There are examples of well-respected Catholic theologians who clearly go beyond the bounds of careful Catholic dogma when they speak about Mary as divine. Among Protestants, such excesses in Mariology may have given rise to a suspicion of talk of a divine mother figure. Whatever the cause, this unspeakable image of God can greatly enrich our spirituality today, as it did for the first 1400 years of Christianity. I'll try to show you how a bit in the next and last podcast in the series. In the meanwhile, question for you. Do you use motherly or other feminine language or pictures when you're thinking or speaking about God? Or is such language unspeakable? Bye for now.